Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you who have joined us here at the frozen land of Kirkville United Methodist Church. Only six degrees, so my car said, but then the thermometer might have been frozen. So, uh, but it is cold. We're warm in here, and we're glad that you are here to worship physically present with us. For those of you who are joining us online, and probably a few more today because of the temperatures, we also welcome you. And pray that you got the bulletin off the email or on the Facebook page and are able to follow along with us. As we begin our time of worship, I like, as I've been doing for the past couple of weeks, sharing something from one of my favorite authors and theologians, A.W. Tozer, regarding worship. Isaiah 6, 3 says, And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Worship is humbling, but is also delightful, invoking a sense of admiring awe and astonished wonder. Its astonishment and wonder are always found in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The difficulty with this today is that everyone is sure of everything. The proud man cannot worship God any more than the proud devil can worship God. Without mystery, there can be no worship. If I can understand God, then I cannot worship God. I will never get on my knees and say, holy, holy, holy to that which I can figure out. But the more I know of God, the less I understand about him. It is in the presence of the Holy Spirit that I begin to recognize what a sinful person I really am. The Apostle Paul said, woe is me. Isaiah the prophet cried, woe is me. Then he came into the presence of God. They were experiencing the mysterious wonder of that one who is incomprehensible. Tis mystery all, the immortal dies, who can explore his strange design. Words from a hymn from Charles Wesley. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, I come to thee, adoring the mystery of that which is thyself. The more I know thee, the more I want to know thee in all the beauty of thy holiness. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'd like for you to join me, if you are able, in a spiritual song done by Chris Tomlin and Jesse Reeves, entitled Famous One. You are the Lord, the famous one, the famous one. Great is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your glorious, glorious. Great is your fame in all the earth. And for all you've done and yet to do, with every breath I'm praising you. Desire of nations and every heart, you alone are God, you alone are God. Great you are the Lord, the famous one, the famous one. Great is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your glorious, glorious. Great is your fame beyond the earth. The morning star is shining through, and every eye is watching you. Revealed by nature and miracle, you are beautiful, you are beautiful. You 
for the Lord, the famous one, the famous one. Great is your name above the earth. The heavens declare your glorious, glorious. Great is your fame beyond the earth. Let's continue our opening of our worship with Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with all my heart before the assembly of believers and also publicly, even before those in authority. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant with us forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, blessing their lives. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provides redemption for his people. He keeps his covenant and promises towards us forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. For those words that are actually the focus of that first chorus we sang, we then rise to our feet if you are able, and we join in our hymn of praise, We Thy People Praise Thee, number 67. people praise thee, praise thee, God of every nation. We thy people praise thee, praise thee, Lord of hosts eternal. Days of wonder, days of beauty, days of rapture filled with light. Tell thy goodness, tell thy mercies, Tell thy glorious might, we thy people praise thee, praise thee, praise thee evermore. We thy people praise thee, praise thee, God of every nation. We thy people praise thee, praise thee, Lord of hosts eternal. For thy blessings, for thy bounty, joyful songs to thee we sing. Songs of glory, songs of mercy to our God and King. We thy people praise thee. Praise thee, praise thee evermore. Praise God. Please be seated. Let us now listen to the word of God that comes to us from the New Testament, from the writings of the Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. He believed you, he believed you were marked in him with a seal that promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteed, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Well, we're missing Jocelyn, so our seat remains empty, but I'm going to share the children's time anyways, because I had someone request that last week, and I didn't do the children's time last week. If you've listened to that passage from Ephesians, you'll know that he also says that we have been given a wonderful, wonderful privilege, and that is of being adopted as God's children. We sometimes feel that we are automatically his children, but... To be a child means to have a relationship, which means to have reciprocity. And so we are adopted as his children because God has one true child, and that is his son, Jesus. But I was going to show, and I'm going to show you, and you can see it afterwards. Good thing it's a big picture, I guess. But this is a young lady, and her name is Anna. At one time, her name was Anna Mae Fuller until I got my hands on her, and she became Anna Mae Holman. I was a single pastor living in Pennsylvania, and she was attending church, but she wound up being abused by her uncles, could no longer live with her aunt, and uh, her mother had, in order to find her own career, uh, had abandoned her, uh, so to speak, with her aunt. With no place to go and no one willing to take her in, I took her in and then in the process got custody of her and then adopted her and she became Anna Mae Holman. And I had her for a number of years. This is her picture when she was in first grade in 1981-1982. I later, as her mother came back into her life, after some counseling and such for Anna and both her mother, I allowed her mother to re-adopt her. So she went to live with her biological mother in Texas. I can sometimes, you know, because she re-adopted her, I could not actually have continued contact with her. And contact later fell away. She's in her 40s somewhere, and uh, I have not spoken to her for a number of years. But I trust in God that even though uh, she was adopted, I love her, and I trust in God that she's being taken care of. Now what's so important about that in this understanding of adoption is that God loves us, and God didn't have to love us. God chose to love us. Now you can say that of a child that's born, like Savannah. Mom loves her dearly. She chose to have Savannah but also children that are adopted have been chosen as well. Chosen not because they had to be chosen, but because of the desire that they be chosen, that they might be loved. And so I would admire, I admire many people. I don't know if you've heard of Mark Schultz. And he's a famous uh, Christian composer and musician. He himself was adopted. I also think of then several others uh, who um, 
Stephen Curtis Chapman, who's a very famous awesome person, who's also a composer and also uh, a singer and performer. And he himself has adopted four children. We understand the importance of human life. That where people do not have parents, yet God is their parent. And God loves them, cares for them more than any earthly parent could ever. So God cares and loves you as well. And I pray you always remember that. And when you feel like you're not loved, you remember that there is one who made you, who chose to love you, and wants to take you into his life. But we too must be willing to be adopted and come into his life. And then we will know unbroken love an appreciation of who we are as God's people. With that, I give as a, prede a predecessor for a message, a witness that Dick Ford wanted to share with us today. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Coincidence. We all live with incidents. Sometimes a couple of incidents come together and you say, wow, why, how did that all happen? I was born on April 3rd, 1937. I'll be 84 in April. Humorously, I always said, well, something happened to some couple around 4th of July weekend. 1936. <laughs> I was born in St. Luke's Hospital in Utica. My mother was spending the months before delivering in a home for unwed mothers in Utica. The Fords, Madeline and Stilson, had been married in 1926. Stilson's father had been a Baptist preacher in Wet, Wet Windshield? No, West Winfield. <clears throat> they lived in West Winfield, and they were Baptist. And Madeline would belong to a women's discussion group in the Baptist church. And they had, Stilson and Madeline, had adopted a year earlier a girl named Suzanne they decided they wanted to have a brother so Suzanne could have a brother to grow up with. So in a women's discussion group one evening, Madeline said, Stilson and I would like to adopt a boy. And uh, if anybody ever has any thoughts about how that might happen, we'd like to know. The next day, Dorothy Smith, the little older woman from that women's group, came to Madeline and said, my niece, is in a home for unwed mothers. I won't tell you where she grew up or won't tell you her name, but she's going to deliver a child in late March or early April. If it's a boy, would you adopt my niece's child? And they said we would. <clears throat> so a month after I was born, in early May, Stilson and Madeline drove to some address in Utica, stood outside a home, which was the home for unwed mothers, run by two Baptist sisters, and out came an Episcopal priest and an older woman, who turned out to be, I guess, my grandmother, and they handed me over. And they took the boy not knowing that this baby had been named Philip Ely. They didn't know that. They said, this is going to be Dick, because my mother loved the Yankees, and they liked the name Bill Dickey. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up very happily in West Winfield, went to Ithaca College and majored in music, came back home by a coincidence. I was running dance bands out of Ithaca, 
and thought I would stay in, in Ithaca, maybe go to Cornell and get a master's degree, but I was successfully playing in a 13-piece dance band and playing, having a good time. One day, my former high school principal called and said, we've had a tragedy. Our music teacher was killed in an automobile accident. Would you be able to come home and teach music? And I thought about it, and I talked with my parents, and I said, well, I got a degree in music ed. Maybe I ought to use it. So I went home and taught. My mother said, Dick, you like leadership. You're pretty good at it. Don't get your master's in music. Why don't you get it in administration? Then you'll have an option. You can teach music all your life if you want, but you might want to go into administration. So I went to Colgate Summers. And at the end of the third summer, one day my high school principal said, Dick, I know you got your master's degree now and you're thinking about going into administration. There's a job over 20 miles over here east in Springfield Central School at the head of Otsego Lake. How many of you know where that is? Okay. You go West Winfield, Richfield Springs, Springfield, and then you go south to Cooperstown. There's a job. So I interviewed with a board of education along with some eight other people and next day or two they called me and they said the board of education would like to hire you. I was 24, youngest superintendent of schools. <laughs> youngest superintendent in New York State and didn't know much about how to do the job. But I had five bus drivers and three custodians and four cafeteria workers and about 15 or 20 teachers. And I was like a sponge. I just said, what do I need to do to help you people do your job better? And I had a wonderful secretary who was a small person. And she was a delight. She'd been in the job 24 years and had trained eight principals how to do the job because nobody had been a principal before they got to Springfield. <clears throat> the second year, a woman called and said, could I have a private meeting with you? This is a mother who had been president of the PTA the previous year, and she came to my office and we closed the door. She said, I need to talk with you privately. She had four daughters. One was in her first year in college at Oneonta. The second oldest was a senior and president of her class, a very bright girl. And then there were two younger girls, one in high school and one in elementary school. She said, we need to talk. My daughter, Sue, is pregnant. And she said, she and her boyfriend are close, but she's pregnant. She says, I've been thinking I want her to be able to have a life and not be burdened at the age of 18 with a baby. I'm thinking of maybe ad adopting that child as be my fifth child so she can go on with her life. And I said, Marie, that's a very thoughtful, thought out thing. Um, but I would encourage you to talk with your daughter, maybe about giving that child up for adoption. I'm adopted. I was adopted by the Fords. I don't know anything about how I came into the world other than I was adopted by the Fords. I guess I did okay because I'm here, got a job. And uh, why don't you talk with her about giving that child up for adoption? Because you'll be in your 60s if you bring that child up when that child graduates from high school. Well, life went on. I left that community after two years. And uh, I had learned later on that that girl did have the baby and she married her high school boyfriend. And he went on, had a good career. Um, when I came to Syracuse University, after two years in Springfield, one day I was visiting with my parents in West Winfield, and they said, we need to tell you the story. The story as it unfolded was, Marie, the woman who came to talk to me in the office about her pregnant daughter, is my mother. I 
said, wow. So I sat on that for a while, and one day I said, I got to go and tell her. I know. So I went and met my mother and said, we need to talk. Do you know I'm your son? She said, yes. She said, I had guessed you were because my aunt arranged for your adoption. So that's my coincidence story. And we say, what were all the coincidences? The man who was killed that got me to teach in West Winfield, the intuitive mother who said, get your masters at Colgate. And I end up being the principal where my mother and my, so she didn't tell the girls for several years. She did let that run. One day, about eight years later, I got a letter from one of my sisters that said, we could not believe our principal is our brother. <laughs> Life went on. She asked, could I list you in my obituary? And she did. And uh, the people in Springfield said, our principal was your brother. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. And there's a parallel story, which I'm not going to tell you, how I met my father just five, six years ago. Another coincidence that I found out who my father was. And uh, that's my story. And um, you might say, wow, that's an interesting set of coincidences. But I'm sure each one of you has something like that in your life. And you might want to share that. So feel free to share it with other people. Thank you. For those of you who receive my daily studies, you'll notice that this past week, there is one on coincidence and God incidents. And uh, as a person of faith, I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in God incidents. You look into the circumstances that unfold and come together, and through the eyes of faith, you can recognize God's hand on our lives. And this is also the weekend. It's very fortunate that this weekend is the weekend of the unborn child. And it's a, it's a, a weekend in which we lift up and celebrate the conception and life, human life, that God gives us and the lives that deserve to live and to be loved and to grow so that God can be in their lives. So I celebrate that. And I celebrate your life that has also blessed us. And uh, Dick, you will be sharing the story about your father. Uh, you and I will talk. <laughs> Would you join me in our hymn, next hymn, Be Thou My Vision, number 451. I 
King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever be still be my vision. If my voice seems to break up, it's not because I'm tearful this morning. I would never be tearful. <laughs> but only because I decided to ski 10 miles yesterday, and I overdid it. And I'll pay for it this afternoon as I'm going to be skiing again at Selkirk Falls, Selkirk State Park with Chick McChesney. So please be praying that he might go light on me because I'm still hurting. But anyways, as we come to our joys and concerns, I'd like to lift up Angelina Jenkins. Her birthday is on February 6th. She's been here occasionally at church. She has to come by bus. She's handicapped. Um, she's also come to Bible study. But she joins with us every Sunday via remote uh, through our live streaming. And she wrote me this past week. She has a birthday on February 6th. And she said for her birthday, she would like to receive cards from people of the congregation, not bought in a store, but made by you, including on them your favorite passage of scripture. Because being distant, she wants to more fully know who you are because she cares and prays for you. And so if you want to send her a birthday card, I send it out by email. I send her address again out for you. It's 14 Pine Ridge Circle, Syracuse, New York, 13212. So she's North Syracuse. So if you would, and I'll send that out by email. Uh, it'll also be on our Facebook page. If you'd like to make a card and send her a card, she'd like to a little bit know a little bit more about you. So please do that. We also lift up the birthdays of Michael Williams. Uh, Esther is a member of our congregation. Uh, Michael goes to another congregation live streaming up in Wolcott. And uh, yet Michael has a birthday on the 6th as well. And his address is there. And what happens is that uh, Esther uh, comes to church here, be it, be it live streaming. And then her husband goes to another church. And then they get together and they discuss both services. Hopefully uh, we win out. Anyways, we want to remember Lori Valentine, uh, Ken Parker as well for their birthdays. So I'd like us to sing happy birthday to all those folks. It goes this way. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, and the best that you've ever had. As we go into our listing of our concerns for prayer, they're before you, and so I'd ask you to be praying for them, but I'd like to add uh, two others. Uh, first is uh, Gerald Davis, uh, Joe Davis's dad. He has worshiped with us just a couple weeks ago he was here. So he travels around the country for his job. And, uh, and so his father, uh, died this past week. So I'd ask you to be remembering uh, Joe and his family as they celebrate the life of uh, Gerald. I'd also like, uh, as Roger Jr. here, I never called him Jr., <laughs> but his dad does, and Roger Sr. is in intensive care after a fall, and he's at Upstate. So if you'd add him to your prayer list, I will put those out as well. Let's be joining them in prayer and pray for healing and restoration for Roger Sr. and all the others that we have before us. We'll have a time of silent prayer, and then as we have our time of silent prayer, you can lift up your concerns and concerns for others. I invite Sharon to come back up and share the prayers of the people for us. Let's pray.
to our Lord and Savior. In our hearts, we kneel before you, ever thankful for the blessings you fill our lives with each day. So many times our prayers are filled with what we want instead of being grateful for what we have. We are thankful for our church. We are thankful for our pastor. We are grateful that during the pandemic, we still gather each Sunday. We are ever thankful for the technology so we can serve those at home. We pray for our nation, our government, and our troops that the unrest will soon be settled, that our beautiful world will see eye to eye and heart to heart. We pray for one another. We pray that we recognize the strength you provide us. We are thankful for our faith that is kept strong by your guidance, your understanding, your patience with us, and your never-ending love. Lord, in you we trust, for without you in our life, I cannot imagine. Everyone said, Amen. Thank you, Sharon. Let's now pray that prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd like for you to take the moment, just turn around, see your neighbor, and wave at them. Pass the peace that way. Keeping our safe distancing, and so we keep one another safe. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the beauty of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the beauty of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Hopefully we have an appreciation for God's powerful work in mystery, the mystery of how he could make and love each one of us because we know who we are and what we are. And we can also turn and see in our neighbor the love of God within them. And indeed, sometimes... Only by looking into someone who, in return, doesn't have to love, but chooses to love us. Do we then understand the mystery of God's love for us. It's a tangible expression in our neighbor. Our reading for this day is we're continuing our saga in the life of Abraham. He's not yet Abraham, he's still Abram in our journey. So we continue our series on the making of an extraordinary life. So we come to Genesis chapter 14. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. One who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. This is the first time in which... Abram is considered a Hebrew in the scriptures. Just thought that might be a sideline that might be interesting for you. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Marmor, and the Amorite, the brother of Eschol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out, to the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. 
During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus, present-day Syria. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative lot and his possessions together with the women and all other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedolehmar, and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom, and Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shavah, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom, and Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you not even a thread or a throng of a sandal, so that you may never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. Let them have their share. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some questions for you to ponder. How does your family react when one of its members is in trouble? What if the threat is moral and of their own making? How quick are you to get help for yourself or for a loved one? In our journey, we have seen how Abram was called to follow the Most High God. It's called that because there are a lot of different gods, but Abram, and there are others, not just Abram, who recognized a creator of the whole world, the most high God, creator of heaven and earth. And even though he started out with his father, Terah, and they stopped Haran, who, which is a city that probably his father established, because it's named after his brother, Haran, all of a sudden God spoke to Abram and said, don't stop here. I've got plans. Continue on to the land of Canaan where your father had started out with all of you in the beginning. And there he went to Canaan. Then from there he went to Egypt because of a famine. It seems that when God calls us to a place, it doesn't mean that necessarily that everything automatically turns out good. <laughs> There's struggles along in the journey. And we have to make choices. And Abram made a choice. In the midst of the famine, he went down to Egypt, where so they, a developed country that he could be able to provide provision. And he made a choice, a questionable choice. We talked about that one. But God honored him. So sometimes we make choices in our lives that are not necessarily the right ones that we should make. And somehow, out of God's incidents, God provides and protects us, even though we don't deserve it. Amen? How many times has God protected you from the consequences that you rightly deserved? We see that Abram came back up and he was even blessed by his time in Egypt to even become a more wealthy man. And then all of a sudden, because of that, they had his family prospered so much that the land could not sustain them all where they were at. So he said to Lot, his nephew who had come along with him, you know, we can't do this. They're starting to be quarreling among our people, and 
we're relatives and we aren't going to have this infighting. If we can't resolve these issues, then we got to part. So you decide where you're going to go. And Lot, because he enjoyed the prosperity that he had come to be used to, looked around and saw Sodom nearby Gomorrah and said, hey, it's lush and green down there. I'm going to go down there. And Abram then said, I'm going to stay up here in the hills because we talked about how Abram, his family was not just nomadic sheep herders. They were merchants. They had wealth. They had education. They were knowledge, had knowledge. I think of that commercial one time. Or was it in a scene in a movie? I can't remember what it was. Where you go by this Bedouin tent, and all of a sudden there's this dish outside, satellite dish. You know, that's kind of how it was. Now, he, we kind of read this Old Testament and think, well, Abram was just an ignorant, you know, nomad, but he wasn't. But he didn't settle in a city. He stayed outside because he also did his trade. And we might even think of the passages of that in the New Testament tells us, be in the world, but do not be of the world. And he was not going to be of the world. And he probably did not like the choice that his nephew made of Sodom. Because it also says in the passage, we read that last week, that Sodom was exceptionally wicked. But Lot sold his moral principles in order to have the prosperity that he so longed for. But you know, there's a consequence for our choices. There's always a consequence for our choices. And all of a sudden, just as I had shared with you that we think of these kings and kingdoms as being what we envision as being large kingdoms, they weren't. There are city-states, and there are many, and Canaan was disputed territory always. And all of a sudden, within this section of the story, there were four kings who then rose up, and they decided to conquer some of these other city-states, probably trying to enlarge their territory, enlarge their wealth, and become more than just a city-state. In the midst of that, all of a sudden, Sodom got invaded. And they conquered Sodom. I don't know where the king of Sodom is at this point in time, but because uh, uh, he come by, comes back and allies himself with Abram and several other kings. And so Lot and his family and all the possessions are taken away. And someone escaped and came to Abram and told him about what had happened. So Abram then made an alliance with several of these other kings, including the king of a wicked kingdom that, is, that his nephew chose to live in, Sodom, to be able to exact justice, to take back the possessions and the people that were taken in captivity. And so they went. And they were successful. Now on one hand, I know that he loved his nephew Lot. And we'll see in a future time here the extent of that love as he intercedes for Lot. But he was loyal to Lot. Even though Lot may have made a decision that was not a good decision to make. Do you have people in your families that have made what you feel is inappropriate choices that led them down the path of consequences they could have avoided. Have there been some times in which you, or maybe you had friends that did that and you were close to them and they made inappropriate choices? You come to a place when all of a sudden, well, what do I do about that? We can rub our hands together and say, ah, oh, well, you know, they had made the smart choice. They wouldn't have gotten themselves in this situation. They deserve what they get. But here we have a testimony of what an exceptional life, an extraordinary life is. A life that is extraordinary is loyal. Despite the fact that Lot chose poorly, yet Abram was loyal. And he knew he was going up against some other forces that were powerful and strong. So he made an alliance. 
It's important to see who he made an alliance with. Some would, could say, well, he made an alliance with the devil. <laughs> One of those kings he made an alliance with was Sodom, which was exceptionally wicked. And so sometimes in our lives, we realize this is another a sense of being loyal. Loyalty then even cares in acts when the person that we're challenged with may deserve what they've gotten. Loyalty looks beyond the choice, the poor choice that someone has made. They may make their choice, but I'm responsible for my choice. What's going to be my choice? The choice of Abram here was to give grace, to show mercy, to go and rescue. It is also, loyalty means, okay, I cannot do this on my own. But sometimes we cannot help other people on our own. And so sometimes we make alliances for the time with people and resources to be able to assist those whom we care about. They may not necessarily be those that follow God as we follow God. We may use government resources. We might use other organizations that are there to help to assist, but we make an alliance because it's expedient for the time helps to provide the best that we can to rescue someone. Sometimes we're not willing to make those choices. Abraham made that choice. But he was faithful. He was loyal to Lot. But then there comes this beautiful story that as they conquered, he was loyal ultimately to God. That's the important part of the story. All of a sudden, the king of Sodom came, you know, that wicked place, that wicked king, probably when the army attacked. We don't know how he survived. Maybe he ran off, leaving his people vulnerable. I don't know. That's not part of the story here. It's part of the mystery. But he comes to Abram and says, Thank you. Thank you. So you keep the spoils of war. You earn that and deserve that. Of course, at this time, he probably didn't have any means of being able to take them from Abram anyways. Right? But Abram made another choice. He says, no. All I want is my people. And if there's spoils of war, you can provide for what they have expended in this rescue. But I want nothing that was yours. He said, I want nothing from you because I do not want it down the road that you can say that I made Abram rich. Now, to understand what that means is that he was keeping his freedom and independence. He recognized that Sodom was a a godless, unprincipled locality. And while he was in the war, or in the world, he was not going to be of the world. He was going to maintain his separateness. That's what holiness is. That's what God expects of us. To be in the world, and also sometimes we have to make alliances with the world to get good accomplished, to do things, but... In some way, we wrestle and struggle, how can we maintain a separateness so that we remain holy and righteous before God? Abram made that choice. He could have been self-serving. Oh, I could have all this that would have been to my, my benefit, but I'm not. Because I... God who provided for me in the present, and God who's going to provide for, for me in the future. So Sodom got all his stuff back. And there's another choice it's not talking about. I imagine that Lot and his family could have said, well, we're going back to Sodom, or 
we could have gone along with Abraham and picked a different location. That's not talked about here, but Lot decided to go back to Sodom. Another poor choice we're going to hear about later. You know the story, don't you? I see you smiling. Poor choices, and sometimes life is complicated because we take one poor choice and we do another poor choice and we make another poor choice and make another poor choice until we make our lives a mess. I think of the adoption theme. There's hard choices to make to give up a child. But it proved to be the most loving choice at the time. And good choices come back around as much as poor choices, they come back around too. Do they not? And then something really interesting, which I want to talk to you about, about the loyalty. We have this strange thing. Then Melchizedek, you like that name? Say that with me, Melchizedek. If you want to read more about Melchizedek, you won't find it because he's only mentioned here. And he then is mentioned in the Psalms, Psalm 100, verse 4. He's mentioned and then in Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 7 because he becomes a central figure that you need to know about Melchizedek. He is a king of Salem. Salem, by the word, definition of the word, means peace. It's also where the Jews get the word shalom, Salem. The king of peace. Now, it's interesting that of all the alliances that Abram made, we don't find the mention of the kingdom of Salem. Where is that kingdom of Salem? We don't even know where that is from, but he was the king of Salem, the king of a place of peace. Okay. And all of a sudden, he was there. And this king of Salem brought out bread and wine. Ooh. Next week, we're going to partake communion. We're going to bring out bread and wine. Is it just coincidence that Melchizedek comes out of nowhere, the king of peace, and he brings out bread and wine? And then he blessed Abram because he was also a priest of God most high. Not of other gods, but the priest of God most high. Ooh. Do you realize the distance between this writing and the life of Jesus and then also the writing in Hebrews? which the author of Hebrews, and you can read those chapters yourself, and I encourage you to do so, says that Jesus is a priest in the line of Melchizedek. He brought out bread and wine. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram of God, by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand, and then Abram responded by giving him a tenth, or a tithe, of everything. The tithe is a representation of acknowledging that God is king of life. I'm not telling you have to give a tithe. That's for God to deal with you in your service to God. But I have to recognize in my own self that everything that I have belongs to God. My choice is not how much I'm going to give, but rather how much I'm allowed to keep. I don't believe in tithe. I believe in that principle. That's the principle Jesus taught. It's not a matter how much I give. It's a matter how much I'm allowed to keep. Chew on that for a while. And then Abram said to the king of Sodom, I will accept nothing belonging to you. In Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Paul writes this as he talks about what we owe our magistrates, our governments. And it disturbs people to read in Romans chapter 3 because Christians are being persecuted. He says, pray for those, for, not against, but pray for those who are in authority over you. He also adds this, owe no one anything. Owe no one anything except to love them. 
What do you owe? Who should you, sh you should be loyal to? Be loyal to God first and foremost. And then for those people who are struggling with their own choices, what do you owe first? You owe loyalty to God. You deal with people with your loyalty to God first. Then you express your loyalty to those around you. And you allow God to tell you how you to deal with them. But how you deal with all people is to love them. The matter of the story that the reason why Abraham sticks out so much is because he demonstrates to us where our loyalties should lie. And that why you're here and why we worship and study and pray is because we're expressing tangibly, physically, to an unbelieving world that has many gods, that we are loyal to God, who had in his plan his son Jesus, who is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who brought out bread and wine, saying, Here, I'm going to bless you if you follow me, take the bread and the wine, and I'll cover every, every poor choice that you've ever made can be forgiven and grace can be yours. And it's that Jesus who came centuries upon centuries later who amplified that message and still does today. Be loyal to me because I will always, Jesus says, be loyal to you. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your loyalty. Thank you for your word. Help us to understand it more fully so that we can comprehend the mystery of your great love for a world that loves to wander from you, that likes to embrace other gods, thinking that's where life is, but only to be found empty and broken. Because only in our loyalty to you do we find fullness in heeding you. Lord, keep us loyal. Keep us loving others, even when they don't deserve it. And we want to shake our heads and say, oh, man, if you just listen to me. But we still love. And we still extend ourselves into rescuing others through our witness, through our ministry, through our mission, because that's what you called us to because you love us so much. This we commit ourselves to in the name of Jesus, king and priest, in the order of Melchizedek, who is the one who truly brings us into the kingdom of Salem, the kingdom of peace. Amen. Would you join me in our closing hymn, number 580? If we're loyal, then lead on. O King Eternal, lead on. Lead on, O King Eternal, the day of march has come henceforth in fields of conquest thy tents shall be our home through days of preparation thy grace has made us strong and now o king eternal we lift our Lead on, O King Eternal, till sin's fierce war shall cease, and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords of clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, with deeds of love and mercy, the 
heavenly kingdom come. Lead on, O King eternal, we follow not with fears, for gladness breaks like morning where thy face appears. Thy cross is lifted o'er us, we journey in its light. The crown awaits the conquest, lead on, O God of mine. Something that just came to mind, verse 1, it says, Henceforth and fields of conquest, thy tents shall be our home. A tent means is that we live in this world, but we're not part of the world. Go, be loyal to Jesus, live in your tent, be a stranger in this place, but love this place, love this world for Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.